Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat and it is 11 a.m. Central Texas time, high noon on the East Coast. Thank you for being here and coming back for a new series that we've been doing for the last three weeks. And it's with Steve Staggs. In our first uh, introduction, we got to learn about Steve's his uh, story. It's amazing to, to talk with somebody who, since a child, knew that they wanted to basically, I want to play baseball. Right. And it's amazing in the simplicity of a child saying, I want to play baseball. And to think that he went to the pros, he went to the show. And you think about that idea in and of itself, it's like, who gets to go? Right. And what does it take? And it's interesting in talking to Steve about how, you know, there's all kinds of kids that want to go play professional baseball. And what's interesting, and I find this in all professional sports or the top of any game, is that there's so much of this that is not about the game. It's actually about your your mindset. And if you think about this, this is at the core of what God made, right? It's funny how much of what we do is created, right? We're creating this future. And to, to think that we're guided along this path and then boy, oh boy, right? You're hitting home runs and the next thing you know, Jesus knocks you off your feet, right? And changes your very like direction and paradigm. And then of course I go to a Texan meetup and a, a, a guy who I invited comes and basically brings his friend and that's Steve Stacks. And I'm standing there and I meet this guy, right? And I got my scotch and I shake his hand and he's like, Hey, and I like literally the Lord says to me, like, pay attention to this guy. And I'm like, and I, I tell this every time. I'm like, is he an angel? That's what I said, because I heard his voice. And you, if you ever get a chance to meet Steve Staggs, he's got this voice. And it's like, and in person, I think it's even more, it has a really unique character to it. And it's like really, really kind and really generous and amazing. And so he's probably blushing. He's in the green room right now. But um I just appreciate him so much because when you have an experience where the Lord directs you, right, whatever it may be, and you know, this isn't my creation. I didn't kick this door down. Like this opened up for me. And you're like, well, you got to treat that. I almost like I treat that very special. It's special, right? And we need to pay attention to these things because it's happening all around us, right? And so this series, which is called Right Side Up, is really a it's an example of the stuff that steve and i've been doing for a while right he's just taking his time and being generous with his time to invest in me and to say hey and what he does is so great he's not judgmental at all he just asks me good questions he's like hey what do you think about this you know and i just it's it's you know what it's done for me you know i've been a christian for 23 years and i'm even asking even the term i'm saying christian is like a misnomer and it's like all right no i'm a called out one by Jesus himself and following after him. And what's amazing about this is I know these stories. I know this Bible. I've experienced miracles. I've, I've seen amazing things happen that it confirmed to me that this is the way. And then you meet a guy and the next thing you know, you're like, hold on a second. It's not only greater in its breadth and depth and all of that, but it's also simpler. And that's, that's what resonates is true for me. And I love it. Right. And it's, it's energizing, it's encouraging. And so I'm like, we got to share this with folks because if my mind is blown like this, you know, chances are yours is going to be blown too. So let's get into the chat, say hello to folks. Thanks for being here. This is different than the normal Monday through Thursday of hyping up the pulse chain launch, right. And talking about, um, Texan token or pulse chain or hacks or anything like that. And, and I, so I, I want you to know if you're somebody that's popping in here, we're going to be talking about spiritual stuff. And I think we're going to be learning about this journey that God has taken Steve Staggs on. And he's, you know, like, I feel like kind of woven me into this story because there's something really important to understand. And I've gotten feedback from people who have watched these last two episodes. And I know some of you are actually on in the live here. Um, thanks for sharing that stuff because it is, it's like... It's a blessing because, you know, you do this stuff and you put yourself out there and, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people about stuff that, um, you know, normally, you know, people are talking about big bags and diamond hands and wind Lambo. 
and it's a risk, right? You step out there and you, you're, you're transparent about the things you're going through and you go, all right, what I'm seeing in all of this is, um, fruit. There's fruit. It's good fruit. It's tasty. Michael Ostow, good to see you. Feed me. Hey, we're going to feed some fruit. We got some fruit off the vine and it's really the fruit of yourself, right? You're going to be producing fruit. And it's, you can see that the Lord is good in all of that. You know, what are we drawing from? I thought that was a big, big concept this last time. What are the roots that you have? Are they drawing from to produce this fruit? Sam Kemp, look who's first. Yes, Michael, mystery man himself. Can't be late for every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Stephen Matt. Hey, careful, careful. We will, we will remind you that we're fellow travelers with you. And we just want to encourage you. But I, I love it. Yeah, we're... we're you're getting it, right? Michael, good to see you. Proceedeth. Yeah, 17th century English always throws me off, doesn't it? Tribal Sounds Force, thanks for being here. And David Lee, all the way from southwestern Indiana. This is a man who's been transformed, and he serves and loves. And that's one of the coolest things about it is, you know, what is the... That's what I love about um, Jesus himself, is what is, the, what is the impact on people when you get close to him? Well, it seems like like everybody benefits, not only you, but like my wife is like, hey, why are you being so nice? <laughs> well, I guess that's fruit of the spirit. Manna from heaven, tribal sounds. Thanks for being here. Uh, hello, David from North Florida. Good to see you. All right. Crypt Crypto Pez is here. Thanks, guys, for doing this. 2 a.m. here in Brisbane, Australia. Hey, 2 a.m., Nico. Thanks so much. Wake up. Just in time. Thanks for getting just staying up for all this. That's amazing that people across the world are tuning in. Uh, to s listen to the an open conversation with Steve Staggs. Uh, Michael, good to see you. Godfather J6, Big Bud Wolf, Hexacron, the best name in all of Hexaco. Rich Liberation, what's going on? Paul Op, the seventh, good to see you. Terrence here. Let's set the captives free. Hey, we're going to do our best to do that. Hornet UK, one, Wen Lambo. Dude, please do not stop saying that in the chat because it's such a fun meme now. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, all right, so let's let's invite him in. Folks, you know, I tried to have all these like creative introductions. You know, it was the mustachio pistachio thing before, which I thought was pretty good. But you know what? Steve Staggs is a friend, and I'm just so thankful for him. So let's bring him in. Welcome, friend. Hey, dude. How are Hello you? All. How are you? How are you? Doing great. Doing great. You, you look good. Thank it's, you. Um, it's a beautiful day here in uh, in Texas. And so I, I just appreciate you coming in for this. What's been, you know, every, it seems like whenever you're talking about these things and you're really examining the edges of Jesus and in his word and listening and doing these things, has there been anything for you over these last two kind of things that you're like observations or anything that you've kind of been impressed with as far as Jesus is speaking to you related to sharing this information. I know I've shared a number of the feedback and all that stuff from folks. Any, any, any comments about that as far as doing this now the third time, third Friday? Yeah, there's this, um, this, there's this interesting dynamic about time that we talk about all the time. Uh, it's, it's in our vocabulary and we don't even really think about it. Most of the time we think about it, in terms of, you know, the time on, my, on our wristwatch or on our iPhone or the date on our calendar. Um, but there is a, is a huge dynamic to time that when, you, when Jesus starts to show you how he created and why he created and what his function is, it completely changes everything everything that you think about time and how you view it. So related to your question, you know, there, there are three basic components to time. There is chronos time, which is, you know, sequential time. One second follows another second follows another second. There's karyos time, which is circular time that um, describes more the characteristics of that time. There is the age, which represents something that, um, that God is going to do, aeon. And then there's the fullness of time. Hmm. When linear time intersects with circular time within the aeon of time. Wow. That God then says now is the time. Wow. 
created beings can handle and deal with and try to manage Cronus time, but they are the ones who produce the circular time of Karyos time. Okay. And only God can cause those things to intersect. And when they intersect, you have the fullness of time. Well, then what is the fullness of time? The fullness of time is that moment when time has choreographed and brought all things together to accomplish a divine decree that God made before he ever started and created time. So when you ask me these things and how the, the two you know, last sessions have gone and what has captured me is that there is a fullness of time happening yeah. that was created and established before time began, that time has now materialized in the form of these conversations. Wow. And so I look at it and go, Lord, you are absolutely the bomb. <laughs> How did, how did you do this? The bomb.com. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. Talk, talk about the atomic bomb and that thing we call faith, you know, last yeah. year. That, that's what strikes me. And David Lee, the, yeah, David Lee's just like sitting there going, oh, my goodness, you're breaking my brain with time. And he's like, all I'm asking is when Paul's chain. Come on, man. That's so <laughs> awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah. Wow. So Keep that's going. What's, Keep going. That's what's what's striking me. Okay. <laughs> Well, you know what's so neat about that? So I'm going to, I like, what I like to do is I like to say back to you just so that I make sure that I'm hearing it correctly. And I think that's helpful. One, it's helpful for me. And this is kind of what you and I do is you drop this bomb of, of concept on me and you go, and a lot of times, you know, either I haven't thought about it or the way in which I thought about it was very surface, right? And so what you're doing is you're saying, hold on, I'm going to bring this into focus better for you. And in a little bit, it's like it turns like a notch. Like, you know, we know in general about these things. Well, yeah, God, he's, he's outside of time. Like, you know, we, we, we have kind of these memes in our culture about, well, yeah, of course, you know, God's like super powerful and like he's outside of this. And, but I think what's really neat about this is this idea that do we really believe that these things were created prior to time even existing? And I think if you were to if you were to try that on for size, you go, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this one on. Does that mean, Steve, that all of these things are known and are appointed? And you know, I often talk about David saying, I fought the lion and the bear, and here's Goliath. That seems like to me this this time that only God can bring together. And then it's like amazing in that they try to put the armor on him and he's like, get this off me. This is the appointed time. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. And that time has a very specific purpose. See, we, I'm speaking for myself. I never saw time in the, in the way that, that Jesus sees time. And so the result of that was I was extremely vulnerable to be to getting out of time. Yeah. And that's that is a majority of the conflict that we experience is this push and pull, this tug, this, you know, forceful element that we experience and feel that tries to get us to do stuff. Yeah. Well, what that is, is that is. A, a force that is attempting to get us out of God's time. Now, that's not just time, you know, 357 on Wednesday right. afternoon. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just that time. It's getting outside of time's role in bringing all things together to accomplish the divine decree. Once I, once I personally saw that, man, once again, the stuff on the planet start getting so very, very simple because I never, I started, let me put it another way. I ceased to see God as reacting to stuff and started seeing him as being the architect that was creating the reaction to what he was doing. Yeah. In the vocabulary of some of my writings in our conversation is, 
he's ahead of the curve. Yeah. He is he is out there ahead of the curve. And what's happening is when he acts and as he's putting things in place, those are creating all kinds of reactions, both good and evil, both positive and negative, both for and against. You know, Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. Yeah. It, it is a simple concept. It's not complicated. It doesn't require any equivocation. It just, this is what I'm doing. You want to join. If you don't, that's cool. You would do your thing, but they are at odds with each other. They're not a comp moving toward the same outcome. Wow. One is in time. One is out of time. Wow. Well, that's really interesting, this idea of in sync, right? <laughs> Synchronizing yourselves or tuning yourself and there's something really interesting because, you know, you think about time and as we observe it historically, we see cycles. Yeah. Right. And it's amazing to me, you know, the scientific world is talking about everything being a wave. Right. We, we think about the double slit experiment and, you know, our observation, which I think is so beautiful because in a way what you're talking about is actually revealed in this idea that when we observe something, it actually forms. Yeah. And. You know, I think what's amazing about being so interested personally in the scientific stuff that's happening and, you know, quantum physics and all this stuff and spooky action at a distance and, you know, these these paradoxes is actually when we see them, they actually are evidence of what Jesus himself has said in his word. What he says to us personally is this idea that, yes, it is strangely with the words that we have a synchronization of the appointed cycles of time and that if you're out of sync what are the you know and and i would say as we are you know as we're desiring to i think live a life that is full and to be of service and to be you know all the fruit of the spirit everything that comes out of that right this this currency, if you will, of God that I experience, which is kind of like this rest of peace, right? Like just saying, Hey, you no, know, like you, you, you don't have to perform like, no, no rest in me. And when I talk about currency, as it relates to crypto, I often talk about, you know, the currency of God ultimately is peace. And what's amazing here is why do I have, you know, you know, why have I gone my own way and gotten out of sync but it seems like he always redeems that stuff when I've gone my own way. And it's almost like, and I use the term redeem rather than using that as if God got us off, off, out of sync. But it's almost like everything that we've bumped into the guardrails or the sides, or we've literally fallen into the ditch. He seems to redeem that in the story. And the question I would say is, is if he's out of time, was that intention? Was it, you know, was that a part of the plan? And so we got a question in the chat, but what, what are your thoughts to what I just said? And then we'll jump into that question. Well, yeah, we, we want to think in terms of orchestration Yeah, that, you know, that, that there are all, all kinds of Christian doctrines around this. How much does God actually orchestrate? And the more that he orchestrates, the less choice there is. So it's yeah. real yeah. hard for us to get our heads around that that God can, and it's what distinguishes him from all other beings, is he can grant absolute choice. Have that choice be settled without it adversely affecting his choice to allow choice. Wow. You know, and it's like, whoa, wow. dude, how did you, how do you do that? <laughs> well, it's, it's because I'm who I am. And yeah, you and know, you're not. I am reality. Yeah. So if I am that I wow. am, I am the reality, then guess what? When I speak, that is what will happen. There's going to be all kinds of choices, all kinds of react, all kinds of stuff around what I speak. And virtually every one of those will contribute to what I have spoken to occur. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that'll break your brain. Okay. 
may I have my brain back? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and it's wonderful because, you know, when it resonates with you and you, you, you get it, but you also know, likely in the future, I'll get this even more, right? <laughs> like, it's like, That's I don't understand. Why it's so fun. Yeah. It's like, this is a concept, an idea, but boy, if I spend time in, in what you said to me, which is what I've taken away from all of our conversations is, hey, we brought up this to your attention, this idea of time. Why don't you go ask him what he thinks about time? Yeah. And I love that. I love that. He's like... See, and that's something I want everyone that's watching this to know. Steve's no guru, right? Steve is, he is, um, he's facilitating something between he and I that we're sharing with you that is really, I think, hey, what do you think about this? Have you thought about what that really means? Let's look and let's ask him, but also let's look at, you know, what do the scriptures say in their original, you know, form? But let's, you know, let's test these things, but let's not just take somebody's word for it. And I, what I love about what you've shared with me is you've never said to me like this. You never once said to me, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. You've always said to me, hey, you've asked me a question and you said, hey, if you're interested in more information, I know the guy who knows it. That's right. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. And it's so true. And I think that that's so what makes it so pure is that, folks, there's no middlemen. With Jesus, the ultimate decentralization, right? He is accessible by you. But Taryn asks an amazing question that really relates to this. He says, what does one do when they ask Christ and, have, and the Heavenly Father questions and seemingly get silence in response? That happened to me last night, um, literally last night. I was up late and I was trying to go to sleep and I'm just like, Jesus. And I was like, you know, without exact questions, desiring for him to speak. And, you know, we talked about this last time that these, the way he speaks isn't just audibly, right? No. Um, it's difficult to have a one-way conversation. And I would say this, Taryn, I agree with you 100%. And it is something that is uh, the mystery of all of this. And, and, and I want to throw one thing into the mix here as you answer this question, Steve. There's something about this conversation that it's like, I look at all the things I read in the Bible. I look at all these stories to try to make sense of them and, you know, ask Jesus, what do you mean by this stuff? And what I see is he uses a lot of people. And it seems like when we're interacting with people in a way, we're doing something that he's kind of designed for us to do, like communicating in community with each other and examining these things rather than just being alone in a closet going, please speak to me. And if you don't speak audibly, you're not real. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that is a great question. And it's, and it's where um, oftentimes we struggle for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the way we've been taught, um, both generally by society and more specifically how we've been taught those of us who have been, who have grown up in the church, you know, been part of the Christian world have, you know, where the Bible is an important document in our, in our lives. We have just, we have not been taught how this works. And yet it's so very, very simple. Um, I don't know if Taryn has, has children, but you know, uh, I've had children, grandchildren, for those who have had children will understand this much, you know, much easier. When you bring your little baby home from the hospital and you stick him in the crib or you put him in the chair and you and you start speaking to them, do they have a clue what you are saying? Nope. Nope. Is it their obligation to know that you're talking to them? No. It is our responsibility as parents to look in the face and in the eyes of the little one, to touch them, to, you know, to speak to them. And the very first thing that they hear are not our words, but more our tone and our attitude toward them that transcends the words that we're speaking to them. There is, in other words, there is a higher level of communication that is occurring between us and our little newborn baby 
than just the exchange of English words. It's much bigger. It's, it's way beyond what these words can transmit. And so that's the first thing that the baby comes to experience is the tone, is the attitude that's in the tone, the quietness of the words, see, the love that is in them. And the baby's not making all kinds of calculations about this. It is simply in an observation mode. Well, that's where we are with Jesus. Remember what he said? He said, unless you're willing to enter into my kingdom as one, like one of these little children, you can't enter in. Why? Because as adults, what we want to do is define how that works, as opposed to observing how it works and then passing that on to others. Hmm. So what have I said in all of that? Taryn, the issue is, if you really want to hear Jesus, then let him take you into your learning process to learn to hear his voice beginning with things that you don't recognize. You just put yourself in a position of observing. Wow. Jesus, I want to learn to hear your voice. How do you do that? How do you teach me? Wow. Okay. Now, here's what's going to, here's the other part of that. Once you start that and you get yourself in an observation kind of mode, just like the little baby, right? They're looking up and going, who the heck are you up there? I have no idea who you are, but you sound really cool. I want to get to know you more. Hmm. See, You'll start finding those kinds of things happening. And what Jesus does, and I'm going to give you a, a, a practical element of that in just a second. What he does is he then starts training the senses that he built in you to start recognizing things that you did not even know were there. Sensitivities, awarenesses, and eventually what will happen is you will actually start putting vocabulary to the things that you've observed and experienced with him. And that vocabulary is the result of him speaking. You're simply restating what you have heard from him. Not through a sequence of words, but through a mechanism of communication that is much bigger than what just the exchange of words do. Now, let's now talk for just a second about words. Words are not designed to transfer experience. It's like in our conversations, right? I'm not going to tell you that this is the end game. I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to introduce this to you. Why? Because why would I, I, there is no way that I could communicate the fullness of what Jesus has spoken, what the, his kingdom represents, how it's worked through a sequence of words. But what I can do is use those words to invite you to go to him, to engage the same experience. Whoa. Okay. And he will bring you into a level of experience that no human vocabulary could ever accomplish. It can simply introduce and invite you in, but he's the guy that makes it happen. Well, why would I want to deprive anybody of that? See? So now, so now let's connect that to this speaking dynamic. The limitation of words is that they cannot create experience. And until you learn to experience him speaking and communicating, no volume of words is going to mean anything to you. So begin with at the beginning. Just simply, Jesus, I want to learn to hear your voice, to recognize when you speak to me, to know you alone. Jesus, will you do that for me? and then just observe and participate and cooperate with the process. And he will take you at a level that no human being could even begin to describe. And, you, and, and since 1982, you told me the other day, you said, um, and I loved it. It was a bit of a confession from you. You're like, Matt, you have to recognize, like I pushed against this for 30 years. Yeah. 
I mean, this is, I, I love it because you're, you know, somewhat self-deprecating in that process to say, Hey, I kind of had a thick skull and all this stuff. And I, I had this journey and what I appreciate so much is that, you know, you've paid a lot of the dumb taxes, you know, <laughs> you're just like, yep, yeah, I've been in the idiot here and hopefully you don't have to do the same thing I did, but it, it's wonderful that you articulate it that way. And I, I've just never heard this stuff, Steve, you know, Here's the thing, guys, that, that just resonates in my ear when I hear you say this. Here we are in crypto, and we look at, we're defending DeFi. I, I was on, uh, there was a newspaper writer that called me, wanted to interview me about the Texan token. And he had absolutely no clear, he misunderstood, he didn't know crypto at all. He thought crypto was Sam Bankman freed and stealing people's money. And so I had to I had to go back to the beginning, just what you did, right? You're like, you bring a baby home. And I said to him, I said, you know, what was Bitcoin created for and why was it created? And we talked about that and he got this establishment. I said, the purity of the reason and the core of why it was created gets bastardized. And, and this is really kind of almost the same cycle that we see in life is that people want to take the thing in its original creation and they want to add to it things that basically soup it up, you know, they, they want to put a blower on it. They want to put, you know, nitrous and then they get all hopped up on leverage and then they lose everybody's money because they want it now. They want it quickly. They want it. And what there's something really, really beautiful in my opinion about the tool of the blockchain itself. It, it's decentralization is really fascinating because I think it actually has a very, it has a connective tissue to the framework of God's creation. And when I see that Jesus walked on this earth for a purpose and then said, I'm out of here. And they're like, where are you going? He's like, I'm sending one who will remind you of everything I said. And what I love about that as it relates to crypto is this. We, we have choice to engage with a contract on the blockchain. We have a choice. And what I think is so amazing is it's like, well, I can describe the benefits, but I don't even have the words. Yeah, You have to like taste and see that the Lord is good yourself because we were talking before we started this stream and I was like, I was like, Steve, I saw a miracle, man. And you're like, well, that's awesome. And that's great. And that's super cool. But I can't even articulate to you. You can go, yeah, I've had a similar experience, but you can't experience the fullness yeah. of what I experienced. But you rejoice in it and you're like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm so happy for you. And you're, you're super kind. But in a way, it was just for me at that yeah. moment and for those that it impacted. And I can share that with you. Can You can be like, yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do want to say to everybody that's out there, and Taryn, thanks for being willing to even say that, because I yeah. think that a lot of times I feel like I feel like when I go into church, I got to sit down and shut up. Yeah. What I love about this is, you know, these are the things, the challenges. When I was a kid, I got to tell you this story, Steve. So my somebody told me I had to go to youth group, right, when I was a kid yeah. in Michigan, and it was supposedly going to be fun. And of course there were girls there. And so I was, you know, more inclined to go and I'm probably in middle school, maybe seventh, eighth grade. And I didn't go to that church for very long, but, um, they went on a canoe trip and the lady who was leading the, um, the youth, I mean, she might've been a hundred. Right. And of course, as a kid, you're like anyone who's old, is like really old. And she was not frail, but she was certainly no spring chicken. And she had these big old 80s glasses on, you know, that probably had real glass in them. And the kids thought it'd be funny to tip over her canoe. Hmm. Well, this woman, you know, and it's, you can't really touch the bottom. It's real mucky. And she was not interested in being tipped over. And I have to say, I was not one of the ones who tipped her over. But she literally, and imagine a woman in her 70s going over the side of a canoe and she lost her glasses and her glasses, you know, heavy, thick glass down eight feet into muck. And she was freaking out because, you know, I mean, she needed glasses to even see, you know, yeah. her face in front of her and the kids. And she was, she was upset. <laughs> and I literally was like, 
I'm going to find those glasses, Steve. I'm like, I'm a seventh grade kid. And I'm like, I'm finding those glasses. So I dove down multiple times and I grabbed a hold of those glasses and I brought them up. And I gave her those glasses and she goes, praise Jesus. And I said, what? <laughs> praise Matt. Yeah. I'm the guy who dove down in the, in the muck and got your glasses. So I'm a middle school kid going, what in the world are you crazy Christian people talking about? <laughs> Jesus didn't like fly in and dive down in the water and grab your glasses. Now, of course, knowing what I know now, it's a funny story to tell. But Tara and I can relate to you in the sense that, you know, when you start, you know, getting into this thing where you're actually willing to go, I got nothing. I don't have the skills. I don't know how to listen. I'm making assumptions about you that likely aren't true. And this idea that we first drink milk as babies and then we eat meat. There's a progression to this whole thing. But the beauty of that is God is so gracious and patient with us in the process. And you said it to me yesterday or the other day, you said, all heaven rejoices. Can you, can you speak to that as it relates to those who come to him and say, I want to know you. I want to hear you. I want to look at your face and observe you. And you said, all heaven rejoices. What did you mean? Because that, like, I had such joy from that, that comment. Yeah, that was in the context of, um, of you making a declaration that your choice was to listen to Jesus and to do what he asked you to do only. That was the only voice that you were giving authority to, to speak to you and to direct your life. Now that was in the context, and I'm going to, I don't know if I'm sharing what I should be sharing, but since you're no, I'm going to, yeah. it. but that was in response to you being concerned that you were actually hearing what Jesus was saying and doing what he wanted you to do. So it was giving opportunity for fear to inject itself into your attempts to learn how to, to live with Jesus and to hear him speak and, and then to learn how to work with him as he's working. Yeah. Okay. Now what happens is we're all coming out of the same cesspool and that cesspool is loaded with this thing called fear. So your good intentions to hear what Jesus was saying and learning how to do what he was doing was now being, um, being attacked, if you will, or trying to be neutralized through the injection of fear. And so the comment was, Matt, the question was, Matt, whose voice are you giving permission to speak to you? Tell me what it is. Who are you? Well, you didn't really understand the question at first, but no. Yep. Yep. Who are you giving permission to? You are an Elohim man who has authority to rule. Who are you giving permission to speak to you? Well, Jesus. Okay. Make that declaration. Establish that decree. Now, this is not fake stuff. This is how it works, okay? And when you do that, guess what Jesus will do? I'll take you up on that, son. Let's do that. Now, what happens is that all of heaven is now in those moments is they, it pauses to listen to the decree that Matt is issuing that is then inscribed into creation. And guess what? When that happens, heaven rejoices and says, there's another son of man right there. Wow. Let's go. Heaven and earth at that moment are joined through the, through the son called Matt. And Jesus alone is the one who has authority to speak to him. Now, does that mean... Other elements, other voices aren't going to try to speak to you? No. It's just that they have no authority to affect you. Now, let's take the next step. 
right? In this conversation, since we're inviting folks into our into our conversations. Yeah. yeah. I said, okay, now here's the next step, Matt. You call fear to present itself to you. And you require it to stand in front of you. And then you say to fear, fear, what do you have to offer me? You have injected yourself into this situation. Tell me what you are bringing to the table. Tell me one thing of value that you are offering me. And require it to tell you. Guess what? They won't have anything to say. Back to Taryn. That's what silence sound, look, sounds like. And then you dismiss it. Depart from my presence. You have no role or place here. Jesus alone is the one that has authority to speak to me. Depart. Wow. Okay, so this is, guys, this is this should shatter your, your you know, worldview in some respects. Uh, Texan Tailgate 4 says this, it's so nice to bring people together in the spirit and mind to converse these topics. Thank you for being in the trenches and discussing the death of religion. I really like that for us because in a way what we're doing and what I feel like my conversations with Steve have been, have been peeling back these things that are kind of assumptions, right? They're, they're kind of, it's like you got to go along with it. Cause I, what I did when I, when I became, you know, when I had this conversion experience, September 10th of 2000, I just started devouring everything. Well, one of the things I thought I had to do was look around me and act like the people around me. Yeah. And the people around me had a culture and that culture was not listening to the words of Jesus. It was a set of parameters and it makes things easier when you're running a church to have kind of some rules. Yeah. And of course, you think about doctrine, you think about religious stuff. Well, what are my expectations when I go to your church? Well, there's a different way of everyone does it, right? There's a style to things. There's a perspective to things. And everyone gets kind of caught up on all of these things. And what's really interesting is, you know, I go to church on Sunday and I, I can see these things now. I don't judge them. I don't like, oh, that's bad. What I say is, hold on a second. If I hear these things and they resonate with me as true, and I start understanding that we are creating and giving our giving our away our authority, if you will, but we're we're accepting the authority of Jesus in our life. We're basically saying, "You're the boss." This really comes from a topic that we wanted to cover on this stream. And that's this idea of authority and naming rights. And I wanted to I want to make this transition here. So the centurion, the story in the Bible, which I absolutely love, is this guy who's in the military. He comes to Jesus and he says, um, my, my daughter's sick. And what's funny about this one is Jesus is willing to go. He's willing to go and like, yeah, I'll go help heal, and which is really amazing to me. Here's the, the son of God in the flesh. And you, you, you say, hey, I need some help. And he's like, okay, I'll help you. And he says, no. No, I'm a man under authority. If you just say it, it will be done. Yeah. And what's amazing in that interaction is that, he, that Jesus is like pretty impressed with this. Like, hold on, you get it. Can you, can you take us to this idea of authority and naming rights and you know, in, in, in this context, weave together this, this idea of being under authority and whose you are, because that's what I think that you articulated to me was math. That's how you say it. You're like, Matt, are you saying that you want to only do what you hear Jesus saying? And you want to follow what he says and where he directs you and guides you and do what he tells you to do. Well, there's no room for anything else. So the centurion's like, hey, dude, I know who you are. And I think I love it because for some people, Steve, like my dad, man, thick skull. He was self-deprecating, but he'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not a very smart guy. And what's amazing is Jesus got to him at 71. Yeah. 
you know, he passed away at 73. And it's what's amazing is I was like, this is never going to happen. My dad's not going to come to know the Lord. And to see him have that experience and, and confess that is amazing. Um, so anyway, I just dumped a bunch on you. What, what are the thoughts as far as authority and naming rights and how that is established and why we can give Jesus authority over our lives? Yeah, um, it, it begins with, um, with understanding the, uh, the vision that the Father had for creating. And we've kind of touched on this in the, pre the two previous um, you know, sessions. And, and by the way, folks, virtually none of what I share with Matt or and now as a result with you came out of study. Not one bit of it. As a matter of fact, all the studying I did had to be stripped away from me because it created an entirely wrong perception and perspective about the kingdom of God, about God, about how Jesus operates, about what this is all about. Um, so if you're wanting to study more, that is not the answer. Jesus is, is, is the one who will start to unlock this for you in a way that will totally blow your mind, not only in its massive majesty, but in its simplicity. It is so simple. It's mind-numbingly simple. Okay? So authority in the, um, in the kingdom of God is given for the purpose of, to bless and protect. Okay. Now that is a simple. So now let's go back to your, to the experience with you, Jesus, you alone have authority to speak to me. And Jesus says, great, I'll do that. Well, what has Jesus just accepted? The responsibility to bless and protect, to exercise the authority of all of heaven to bless and protect. Okay. Now there's a lot that goes in there, but let's, you know, kind of start with that. Now, why is that important? Why were you able to grant that authority to Jesus instead of Jesus just taking it? Interesting. Okay. Well, same thing with the serpent in the garden. We think that the devil is so powerful, we could go down an entire, you know, lit, litany of questions about what we think about angels and what we think about the devil and all of that stuff. 99% of it's going to be wrong because that's how we've been taught. That's what Jesus has to strip away. If, if Satan was so powerful, why did he not just come into the garden and saying, dudes, I'm taking over. I'm the badass here. Yeah. I am the man. If you don't know who I am, you're about to find out. I'm taking over. Why didn't he do that? Why did he have to go through this convolution of you know, of exchanges with Eve to get her to agree to enter into a transaction with him in order for him to secure her authority. Wow. Because he doesn't possess authority. That's not what he has. He does not have the authority to rule. We have the authority to rule. Why is that important? Okay. Where does that come from? Well, that goes back into the Father's vision for creating. Has anybody ever asked you, why did, why did the Father create? What did he have in mind? What was he thinking about? See, what was the end game that he had in mind? Why, and how did he plan to get there? What was that all about? Well, Christianity has an answer, but the answer is absolutely makes no sense if you pause Take a step out of it and just look at it and say, okay, huh, I've got a contract in front of me. I think what I'm going to do is evaluate if this contract is actually saying what I think it says. 
Isn't that what you would do as a business guy? Isn't that what you do when you enter into a relationship, you know, with a customer or with a, with a partner or even at the employment level? Don't you, you know, reduce that to a contract of some form to make sure the both of you are on the same page? Yep. Well, we don't do that when it comes to why did God create? It makes no sense the, what we are told the reason that God created. So I asked him, I'm a business guy. I know what it is to, you know, to build businesses and run businesses and stuff like that. Well, gee whiz, why don't I just try it? Father, why did you create? What was the vision that you had in mind when you created? Son, thank you for asking. Wow, what a, Thank you for asking. Can you imagine the God of all creation saying thank you? Well, that's kind of back to turn that looking into the eyes and hearing this, the kindness of this, of the voice that is really our greatest, who is our greatest advocate. Son, the reason I created my vision for creating was that my man would learn to rule my creation with me in the fullness of my nature and character. That is my vision. And if you learn to follow me, I'll teach you how to live that way. Okay. Wow. Well, guess what? In order to rule, I have to have authority, right? Yeah. And if I'm going to exercise authority, what is the purpose for that authority? To bless and protect. See, so that anything and everything that God entrusts to me, my authority is to be used for one reason, one reason alone, and that's to bless and protect. Okay, wow, how do I do that? Good question. Follow me, I'll show you how to do that. I'll teach you how heaven rules. I'll teach you how heaven exercises its authority. By the way, isn't that what, I responded to the disciple who asked me how to pray. Yeah. See, as in heaven, so also in the earth. These things are not separated, son. Heaven and earth are, are two parts of the same creative, you know, component there. They're two sides of the same coin. Now, what happened is, that's why when the, when the serpent entered the garden, and entered into this transaction with Eve that Adam then partnered in accepting, that at that point, um, authority was no longer about blessing and protecting. It was about ruling and ruling over, um, in Christian terms, it's called lording over quite often, but it is to rule with heavy handedness in order to create compliance. And at that moment, we returned right, we returned from right side up to upside down. The authority that we were given to bless and protect was now going to be used to create a heavy-handed compliance model that put us under the heel of the one to whom our authority was given. Wow. Okay? And that's what we experienced. Okay, so we gotta we gotta break this up. This is <laughs> enormous. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to say it back to you here. This is this is amazing. See, every time I hear it, it's like it gets even better. You know what's amazing is I, one of the things I want to share with you. If you're somebody that grew up in the church, and you know I've had kind of these 22, 23 years of it. A lot of these things sometimes are a bit shocking to your system because it's. But here's the thing that I've I've experienced in in spending time with Steve and and listening for myself. I keep coming back to the fact that he always says, "Ask him yourself, dude. Don't trust me. Ask him yourself." So that's what I did, and I consulted with what I know about the Bible and what I know about all these things and these questions that Steve asks. And you know, he's like, "Hey, I asked him, why did you create?" And I think what's really fascinating about it is it's almost like I've been reading Christianity through an old black and white TV and that somebody decided to put me in a theater and it's in technicolor. You know, when it goes in the, 
you know, uh, Wizard of Oz and it's like all black and white. And then it's like you go in, it's like, oh my goodness, hold on. I knew that there were some probably some cool things here, but this is like way beyond and it's, wow, it's detailed and it's wider and it's bigger and it's amazing. So here's the thing. I, I feel like we have, especially in the stories that we tell each other within the church, kind of a, um, an accepted way of describing the fall of man. And we kind of just take other people's word for it rather than really looking at what is, what is this? And then asking Jesus himself, reveal this. So when you said to me, hey, I asked him, and this is what he said. Well, if you look at, so that I did, I went and I looked at all the different things Jesus said. And it's like, hold on a second. This is exactly what he said. He said, on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, all of these things that reinforce the fact that listen to Jesus, everything, like, it's amazing. Like how much, twice that I can think of in the Bible, the actual God spoke and said, this is my son who, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. And I'm like, okay, okay, so I'm going to start listening. And what's amazing about what you just said is that I loved it. When you don't have authority, you know, you think about, just look at any situation in which somebody's been given authority. And I keep going back to the prodigal son. I keep going back to Mordecai. Oh, my gosh. Mordecai is a perfect example of this. And Esther is that Artaxerxes gave him a ring, and he could not decree anything in the kingdom without that ring. And it's this picture of a signet ring. And I wear this signet ring. What is the signature? Well, it's authority. And this idea that the impression is making something official. And to think that prior to the serpent confusing Eve and, and tricking her, if you will, before even Eve showed up on the scene... Here's, here's Adam being given authority to name the animals. And I think what's amazing is he gets in the, 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 the progression of that story is so wonderful because he's like, where's my version, right? He's like, I, I see, I see these, you know, male and female of these things. We're naming these things. He's saying, let's practice this authority I've given you. I created it and it's very good. And I've given you this authority to, bless and protect these things, right? What's amazing to me, and it becomes technicolor, is you're, this vision I have in my mind of what is it like when this crafty one, right? The snake, the serpent, right? And it, it even establishes in that story that, that the serpent was the crafty, one of the most crafty animals the Lord God had made. So that's a whole other thing that we've talked about in the past, this idea that, hold on a second, this wasn't a surprise to God that this crafty serpent came in here and lied to you. But what really blew my mind this last week was the fact that what I've kind of glossed over as the fall of man is actually a transaction of giving one's authority away. Can you speak in like, let's drill down on that idea because I think everything falls into this. When we talk about the world being upside down this is the moment at which it went upside down. And it was, it was based on authority given away. And I, I have to add this to it. There's so many other stories about birthrights. There's so many stories about somebody grabbing another guy's heel or stealing this thing or this was mine. And there's so many stories about about people trying to get into and be a part of the thing that God gave us. Because it seems like in the fallen world that we live in, there are, there are those who are jealous of our lordship and of our authority and of who we've made to be. Because you've said to me many times, you said, it's almost like we've forgotten who we are is that in him, if you think about this, no, 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 you, when things are right side up, no, no, when it's very good, you are my son. You are an extension of me. You are created in my image, and I'm going to conform you to my likeness, bro. And I'm like, that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do, because I know that you got everything else handled. I don't have to kick down a door. You open them. 
but I have to be in alignment with you. So will you drill down again and maybe you repeat yourself, but like on this moment, because I've just, we, I've just so cursorily talked about the fall of man, but what you're saying is very specific. And I think it informs everything else that I read in scripture. Yeah. Um, we could probably spend the rest of this session on, on that question. So yeah, um, there are a lot of elements that kind of feed into it. So, um, so we'll, Lord, thanks for giving us uh, the ability to communicate this with some clarity, right? And, right, uh, right. Because it's such a huge question. Right. Um, let's, let's begin with this. Why did the serpent wait until after Adam named all the animals before he showed up? Why did he do that? Why didn't he just name them? Right. Why didn't, why did he, why did he wait? Okay, so now let's go back. So let's deal with this naming rights yeah. issue again by refresher. Naming rights is, um, it basically says this, the one who names or the one who accepts the name is subordinate to the one who gives the name. So we know this. Um, so we know this about in our own families. You know, when we were first talking about this and this is where by reminder, well, Matt, who named your children? Yeah, I did. Yeah, My wife did. You, yep. you and your wife did. Okay. So who has authority over your children? We do. Yeah. It's do clear. I have authority over your children? No. No. Does anybody else on the, you know, that you know, including your parents, have authority over those children? No. No. Why? Because you named them. See, that's the simplicity of the idea of naming rights. So um, second part of that is Solomon made this really interesting statement in, in Proverbs. He said, as a person thinks, so are they. So the way I think is the way that I am. So if you wanted to control me, what is the first thing you would attack? How you think. Perspective. How you think. Yeah. Okay. Guess what? I have just described the conflict, the conflict between heaven and hell. It's no more complicated than that right there. Say it again. As a man thinks, as a person thinks, so are they. So if you're going to attack a particularly someone who has less authority than you, then guess what you're going to do? You're going to attack the way they think because the way they think is the way they are. Now, by the way, that is happening right now. This may seem oh, like yeah. oh, yeah. but I'm going to come back and bring it very practical in our real life experience today. How naming rights is working right now. And we don't even know it. Yeah. We're giving ourselves to it, thinking it's right. Yep. How many times have you heard how People, de people declare, people appeal, people, you know, in the news, politicians, all of that, that we need our constitutional rights protected. Now, think about that for just a second. We are, we are appealing to the Constitution to protect our rights. What then becomes superior? What is superior in that exchange? The Constitution. The Constitution. Well, guess what? That is a naming right. We have just named the Constitution as being superior to us. That makes total sense. Okay. Now, guess what? That is a redefinition. That is a turning upside down of what that Constitution does. That Constitution does not delineate our rights, what it does is it delineates the limitations that we as the superiors to the Constitution have decreed that the 
government that represents us will abide and operate within. Wow. It is not conferring rights to us. It is limiting the authority of government. Yep. But see what happens? The moment we appeal for our rights, we have become subordinate to the Constitution. Bam. See? And guess who's now given oath to abide the Constitution? Our politicians. Yeah. And they say, okay, we'll do that. We will rule you through our interpretation of the Constitution. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. time out. That's not how this works. Now, let's look, and I don't, don't want to get political, but I want to give very, very practical ways that this is operating it, even today. It's easy to talk about how, how it looked in the garden, but let's see how the garden is actually functioning today. So at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, election, the last federal election, presidential election, there is this big move by a huge mass of the population demanding a recount, a, an examination of the votes. They're now in, the, the Congress is now in session. Mike Pence is being appealed to, to, you know, hold back the counting, uh, you know, this whole affirmation of the election. And he says, I cannot do that. His position was, I cannot do that because I swore an oath to, appeal, to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution does not give me authority to do that. Wow, how right that sounds. Wait a minute. You are you you are appealing. I mean, you are appealing to upholding the Constitution, but the Constitution has a higher authority, and the higher authority are the people. And a sizable portion of the people are now demanding an examination of the election which is their, now we're into God-given, which is their God-given authority to require. Well, Mike appealed to the Constitution as the authority over the people instead of seeing the people as being an authority over the Constitution. Guess what? Naming rights. Yeah. That is how naming rights work. If you... Whoever names or whoever, whoever is named or who accepts a name becomes the subordinate of the one who named. That's another way of saying it. We subordinate ourselves to the one who, who names us. Just like our children do. So now let's go back into the garden to see where this all began. Right now, what I just shared, it could be, you know, that could be construed as being pro Trump or anti Biden or any of that. That's not the intention. See, it is understanding the effect and impact of naming rights. If we demand that the Constitution, um, that our constitutional rights are protected and that government is responsible for protecting those rights, we have just subordinated ourselves to politicians, to the government. Yep. Guess what? The government is happy to accept that. Yeah. Okay? And until we say no and turn this thing right side up, no, that's not how this is going to work. The Constitution is subordinate to us, not us to the Constitution. And if we want you to do something and a sizable per, you know, a percentage of us are demanding it, you need to pay attention. Because we are the we are the sovereigns in this yep. country. Yep. We don't understand this because we don't understand naming rights. It's fascinating. You know, this is the topic in Texas independence. And someone like Daniel Miller, who's leading a very practical sense, is saying, you know, we 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 find these things to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they have received inalienable rights from their creator. Yeah. And what's interesting is why do we form these? If you read the Declaration of Independence, it's really interesting. Why do we create this stuff? Why do we even have rules? Why do we have a constitution? Well, because 
we got to basically get along, right? The civilized society is based on, hey, let's not, you know, kill each other. Let's make sure we settle our disputes. Let's make sure that we got some trash service and maybe the water will figure that one out. And what's interesting is, well, we think that this might be the best possible thing right now for our kind of life, liberty, happiness, freedoms, whatever. But there comes a time in human events where you have to abolish or change these things because the authority is not. And I, I love this so much. It's very practical, but it has so many different applications yeah. in one's individual life, too, is that I feel like we're giving away authority all the time. But what you're saying, and I think you're, you're about to go to, is this is what happened. The fall is actually a function of giving authority away in a transaction. Can you, can you drill down on that? Sure. sure. Okay, let's, let's go back to the, to the question about the garden. You know, why did Satan wait? to enter into his transaction with the serpent before he approached Eve. So why did he wait until after the animals were named? Because that's how he got his authority, right? Pardon? That's how he got his authority. No, because he did not have the authority. Oh, no, no. So I'm sorry. He was underneath Adam. What I mean, I, I, I'm using the wrong term. You're right. But what you're saying is Adam named him first, which showed his authority over him. Yes. And that's, he comes in after he is under the authority of man, because otherwise he wouldn't have to fool anybody. Well, sort of. Okay. For clarification's sake, there, and there are three classifications of beings in, in God's creation. There's the Elohim, which is the ruling class, their angelic class, which is the ministering class. There is the animal class, which is the serving class. Man is a part of the Elohim class. And not only is he a part of the Elohim class, he is the highest order in the Elohim class, in the ruling class. Okay. Now, so when, when Jehovah brought the animals to Adam to see what he would name them, it was to establish, as you shared just a minute ago, to establish his authority over the right. animals. The reason that, that Satan did not come before that time was because he did not have, possess the authority to rule, which comes to, which is then a component of naming. Yeah. When you name when you named your children, it's because you had the authority to rule. Yeah. Okay. I don't have the authority to rule your children. Right. See, so I can name them anything I want to name them. It wouldn't make any difference. There was nothing in there. So now in the kingdom, what, what is comprised? An, what does a name comprised of? What is the purpose and importance of a name? It is because in the kingdom dynamic, the name is the repository for all that God put into that being when he created it. Wow. See, so his name shall be called Jesus. God saves. Okay, pause for just a second. Okay. Blow on my mind because, <laughs> because an angel appeared and told them, basically God said, like the name of Jesus was not given to him by Mary and Joseph in the sense of like, I gave my kids names. Yep. They were told what to name him. Yep. Wow. Yep. Okay. Because there was a repository in that name was the repository of all that God had vested in that person, Jesus, through the name. And there's so much power to the name too. That's what's amazing. And you see so many examples of that. Wow. Well, your signet ring concept. Yeah. Okay. What happened? Your name is now verified and validated through the grant of the signet ring. Yeah. See, that signet ring is not given to me. My name carries no authority regarding that signet ring. Only your name does. Yeah. See, it's a, it is a powerful, powerful concept when you look at it and then you start understanding, you know, 
in certain instances why God changes a name, and in another instance, Satan re- disregards a name. Yeah. Or he says, or he actually acknowledges it. Are you coming before the time? Jesus, are you coming before the time to, to judge us? Hey, is that what you're is that what you're planning to do? Are you going to use your name, your authority, your station and position in all of creation to unlawfully ban us? Yeah. Temptation. Yeah. See? So now let's go back in back into the garden. So the Satan did not have the authority to name because in the name he did not have the the authority to rule which is a component of naming when i name i have the authority to rule that absence of a name that's why i've been created remember the father's vision is that his man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character So in the grant of a name is not only the full authority that's vested with that name, but it's also filled with the goodness of God. That's its intention. So now, how did did Satan go from, from a spiritual being? He's a great, fun discussion to talk about as well. Uh, But for now, how did he decide to go to the serpent to try to engage transaction with them? Hmm. Why did he pick the serpent? Why didn't he pick a beetle, an eel? He was the most crafty. Oh, but why was he the most crafty? Was it his attributes? Well, where did those attributes come from? God gave him, um, created them. Okay. And who named them to establish the repository of that serpent as distinct from other animals having those attributes? Adam himself. Adam did. And Adam said, this one has been, has been, has been granted the authority, the, the attributes is a better term. Yeah. The attributes of being wise, of being shrewd, of being crafty. Hmm. This is the dude who's going to, as a serving class being, is to help aid my man in executing his responsibility on the planet. And Adam saw him and said, you, yep, you're the dude that's most wise of all the beings that God has created to operate on the land. You're the man who's going to be called the serpent and serpent, your job is to help me. Satan said, okay, that's the one that I want to talk to because that's the one who is the repository of of shrewdness, of sensibility, of intelligence, of craftiness. Not craftiness in order to exploit, but craftiness in, in goodness to be able to navigate around difficult situations that will confront you as life unfolds in all of its dynamics. There is somebody who must understand how to navigate around these things in a shrewd and crafty manner. In good. So Satan said, that's the one because that's the one that Adam vested with the authority to speak to him to gain counsel is how we might otherwise say. Wow. Okay. So what happened? Satan said, okay, I want to engage contract with that one. So he engaged in transaction with the serpent. How do we know that? Because because the serpent acted as his agent. He transferred his message. The serpent could have said no. Now, why was the serpent vulnerable to that? Because he was part of 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 the serving class. He was designed in his makeup to serve. Part of the serving class. So you know that there is a transaction that occurs between Satan and the serpent, and then the serpent goes to Eve and engages in this transaction with Eve. And she wasn't surprised he was talking. Nope. She just engaged conversation with him like it was an everyday event. Hmm. 
yeah, man, I got this problem. Don't quite know how to act wisely in this particular situation. It's kind of got me, you know, by the tail here. I'm not quite understanding how to deal with this. Oh, I know how to deal with that. I know how to deal with that. Well, what is your advice, Mr. Serpent? Well, there's this tree over there. Right? Didn't God give you all this liberty? Well, why don't you exercise your liberty? Yeah. Well, yeah, but he says, if I do, I can exercise my liberty with everything except for this one thing. There's this one limitation. Well, what's that limitation? I'm not, we're not to eat. Not only are we not to eat, we're not to touch it. We're not to strike it. We're just to keep our distance. Nah, if we don't, if we eat it, if we touch it, if we strike it, we're going to die. Now, my question is, what did dying look like to Eve? Yeah, yeah, good question. See, that became, a, that was a meaningless term to Eve. What, what was dying? What was death? What was that? You know, that's like the first time I looked at a balance sheet and I looked at the, right? <laughs> and I looked on the liability side and saw stockholder equity. And I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. How is stockholder equity a liability on a balance sheet? See, that's something of value. What is it doing over there? It didn't have meaning to me. I'd suggest death had no meaning to her. And so the, the wise one said to her, no, you're not going to die. See? Actually, what's going to happen is you're going to become like the Elohim, knowing the difference between good and evil. Hmm. What to do, what not to do. What's in my best interest, what's not in my best interest. What the right thing to do and what the wrong thing to do is. Man, that's exactly what I need. Okay, let's do that. Now, the moment that happens, see, see the transaction that's going on? Now, here's this interesting thing that Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, and he, he poses it in the form of a question. Questions are powerful because they open up the mind and they get you to think. And they go, oh, yeah, how about that? And you've, you know, you've experienced that yourself. We all yeah. have. He says, do you not know? Do you? And actually, here's how he puts it. Do you not see with your physical eyes to peer into the spiritual world to understand and comprehend that the voice you listen to and obey and under whose authority you act, you are a slave? Oh, as a man thinks, so is he. Okay, if I want to control him and he is of a greater authority than I am, I have to fashion the way he thinks. So if I can get him to think the way that I think, the way I want him to think, I can control him and he won't even fight me. He'll just be that. Do you not know? The voice you listen to and under whose authority you act, you are a slave to that voice. And we have been doing that ever since. Yep. So Satan did not come in through the, his agent, the serpent, to exercise power as by force. He did it through cunning because he had no authority to rule. He had to gain he had to have Adam and Eve transfer their authority to rule to him. And we're doing it today. We're doing this exact same thing today. We continue to transfer our authority because we don't understand naming rights. We don't understand who we are. We don't understand how the game is played. And so we get sucker punched one, you know, one time after another. Now, here's what happened as a result. 
We talked about it before. All of a sudden, once Adam transferred his authority over the earth, that he was given charge to rule with, with God, once that happened, then everything was turned upside down. The man who lived forever was now going to die. The man who lived in um, as the recipient of the abundance of, uh, of, of provision that came through the earth was now living in scarcity. The earth that was to serve him, he now had to serve the earth. See, all of these things were turned upside down. The one whom he spoke with freely every day, Jehovah, and spoke with him, you know, about all of the things that life had to offer. Now, all of a sudden, he was now afraid to hear his voice. Okay. The one who lived in purity was now ashamed because he was naked. Upside down. Boom. Yeah. Now, thing is, we're the ones that still possess the authority to rule. We just got to quit giving it to giving it to the serpent, if you will. And how do we do that? By the very declaration that you made when in our last conversation, Jesus, you alone have authority to speak to me. You alone have the authority to direct, to direct my life and every decision that flows out of that. Once you learn to do that, the door is shut on the serpent and things start turning right side up. You know, it's amazing about this conversation. This is fantastic, man. Like, wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what what I want folks to notice about what Steve just shared, because well, obviously it's just amazing, and I'm just like, blows my mind in a wonderful way, is that Steve never said, hey, here's how you get saved. You notice that, folks? I think it's really important to note. I think a lot of people have been told, and here's this, this amazing thing. You know, I'm reminded of the seed that fell on the path. And Jesus talks about the story of those who, the, the seed that falls in, some of it gets choked out, some of it gets trampled underfoot, some of it grows up and produces fruit. And there's so many different stories that, you know, if you start engaging with this idea, right? You say, all right, who has authority over me? And I think that that's this, this, it's a big idea. It's the idea. It's the whole thing, right? The simplicity of everything. It's everything. It's like, whose voice are you going to listen to? And Taryn mentioned this earlier, Steve, and I just want to kind of try this on for size. Is it possible you know, you've, you've defined that the, the voice of Jesus can come in so many different ways, like a parent, and it can be intention, it can be circumstance, it can be a feeling, it can be, it doesn't have to be like spoken English words. Yeah. It can be a number of things. There's something, though, really interesting about this idea of declaring, because we're talking about this idea of speaking and declaring who we belong to and who we're committed to listening to. And it seems so much more pure to me, because when I, I remember when, when I had a 1,000 pounds lifted off my back, and I, I was there going, oh, and I, I started laughing. I'm like, the implications of this, you know, like basically I'll never be the same. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've talked about so many different things about how God gave new names to everybody. And, you know, we, we read scripture about a new creation in Christ, this idea that the old is gone and the new has come. And what I think it sits at the very epicenter of this is whose voice are you going to listen to, one, and two, has authority over you completely? And I think that what I love about that is this isn't what church you go to. No. This isn't, well, daddy was a Quaker. This is not that. And a lot of times I think what's amazing about this is why do people have such a problem with Christians? This is why. Because we are not under the authority and we're not listening to the voice. And I think what's amazing about this is 
it's like everything falls away, Steve, because this is just an observation of this. You know, I'm always, you know, crypto heartbeat, right? Trying to tell people, hey, consider other people, love people, right? Like we, we win together because we're working together and we, we can, you know, and there's, a, there's grace in that. There's all kinds of things in that. But if you think about it, what really is going on here? What is money? When Lambo? All that kind of stuff. And I just reminded of this, these coins in this bottle is that why are your 23 people here? Because, you know, there's something that's drawing you to this to say, hold on a second, money and all these things that I've heard. And even when I've gone to church and when I've heard, you know, people kind of tell me something, it's fallen flat. And that's how I felt for 28 years of my life. I was like, this stuff is hokey. This stuff doesn't have any power. This stuff is, it's like you're playing a game. And I almost question whether it's authentic for you. It's almost like you feel like you have to repeat this stuff because somebody told you this stuff. But then you run into somebody like you, Steve, and I've had people in my life where I'm like, hold on, there's something different here. And it's really interesting to say, And, and we can, t I don't want to talk about it, you know, get into this right now. But you asked me the other day, because I've dealt with massive anxiety in the past, and it creeps up on me a lot. And, you know, and when I and embrace this stuff and examine it, because I'm thinking about this stuff all the time, is, I, I, well, if I'm listening to his voice, and I'm doing what he tells me to do, and I'm testing all of these things, and I'm giving him authority fully with everything. You asked me the question, you said, Matt, what's your intent? Because what you've helped me understand is this idea that I'm making choices. Yeah. You know, I've got this ability to make choices. And I feel like the Christian worldview right now, and a lot of what I would consider to be stale Christianity, is a lot about rules and behavior, right? like act a certain way, this outcome, right? It's like you said, I could shine the fruit up. But it feels like it's a lot focused on, well, if you aren't, if you ladies aren't wearing skirts and you don't cover your hair and you're not doing this or that or the other, we're, 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 we're being distracted by all of these activities. And it seems like the purest form of the gospel, if you really boil it down, is like yelling at you. It's yelling at you through the scriptures, not in a bad way, but it's like, it's amazing to me that <laughs> everything you've told me and everything I've looked in the scriptures, it's like it came out of it as, well, duh. But it's almost like I didn't see it. Yeah. But then when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. When they went up the mountain, he's like, yeah, listen to him. He's my son. Oh, and then, yeah, he's going to remind you of everything you said. And he speaks. And then he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's, he's like sweating blood. And he's having a conversation with the Father going, hey. <laughs> he's listening to the Father. He says, I don't go anywhere. And then you said to me the other day, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You said, the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. We talk about that because that just like, like to me, that was just like dropping the, anvil on my head well yeah and you know in that in the context of the um, verses that you're referring to jesus is talking about um a, a lot of false prophets a lot of false uh teachers a lot of false messiahs on and on are you know show up and they're, what they do is they don't go through the, the gate. They try to climb in through some other mechanism. They shortchange it. Uh, because, and the reality is they, sh they have to do those things because they don't have the horsepower authority to do that, you know, to be a shepherd. So they have to come in with some other, in some other way. By the way, that's exactly the way Satan came into the garden. He didn't, he didn't present himself as, you know, an angelic being. <clears throat> he presented himself through the serving class. Mm -hmm. Why? 
Why did he do that? Because he had to come in through some other way. He couldn't come directly through, if you will, the gate. Remember the gates with the flaming soil? Yes, yeah, swords. Yeah, swords, yeah. See? There was an appropriate way to enter into the garden. He couldn't do that. He had to come in through some other way. And so, and so Jesus was saying, listen, um, the shepherd has some very unique characteristics about him. His character is that he will give his life for the sheep. His character is to give that which is most important to him for the benefit of those over whom he is caring. He is exercising an authority that is different. And when you are exposed to that different authority, when you are exposed to that different nature and character, when you are exposed to that one who speaks to you in a certain way, not the words he speaks, but the nature and the character that are saturating his words, you come to recognize them. And every other voice is an assault against that. Why? Because those voices don't possess that. They don't have the nature and character. So eventually the sheep learn to hear the shepherd's voice and the voice of a stranger, the, those who do not possess that nature and character, they won't listen to. Yeah. Because it's inferior. It is contrary to all things that are good. Now, here is the deal. The sheep weren't born sheep. See, they were born lambs. See, and they had to learn over time. They had to engage the game. Like May, what was his name? Chris May or Charles May or whatever the last week. Oh, John May. John yeah. May. Yeah. Um, conversation to John. Same thing with Taryn. Yeah. You're not going to learn this from a distance. You have to engage the game. If you want to learn how to play the game, you got to get in the game. Well, guess what? Sometimes when you're in the game, you got you get knocked on your butt. Yeah. Sometimes you get struck out. You know, sometimes things happen to you where it appears like you are losing. Well, guess what? You're not losing. You're learning how to play better. Your adversary is actually teaching you how to play at a higher level. Let him teach you. See, you're not giving him authority to be your teacher. What you're doing, you've already given authority to Jesus. And if he wants to use him, let him use him. Wow. Because he's going to fulfill his responsibility. The reason he was created, which was to protect the throne of God. And so he protects the throne of God in us by teaching us how to play at a higher level. Anyway. Well, so, don't you think so? Yeah, this, this is amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize because this is this is my favorite one. This is so great. I can't believe it. it. Every time, it's just like something special happens that we didn't intend, and something special has happened that we did not intend. Huh. I mean, we wanted to 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 share this kind of interaction that we have with people, but to me, this has been like I'm seeing things anew each time we talk. One of the things I think I'm taking away from this, because I, I see myself in people's shoes, right? Because I feel like I've been, I've really questioned a lot of stuff. You know, I'm just like, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't resonate. And so when you, this idea of giving and actually saying these things, because we talked about this last week, we were like, well, Matt, do you want to basically submit to Jesus's authority completely in your life and listen to his voice. Well, I would say this, all things, all fullness, like this is the direct connect to the creator of all things. Yeah. Do you think the creator of all things who created time, created all of these things, everything, all these dynamics knows what's best for you. If he is there to protect, right? And bless I want to be in the protection and blessing of the one who created it all. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think about this idea of, hey, try it on for size, right? You know, one of the things that I think we see is 
And, and what's striking me is this idea that just going and saying, you know, I want to hear from the spiritual realm. You may hear something. Oh, yeah. But the question is, you need to understand that even Eve was deceived to give authority away. And there's one that's prowling around. And I think what's interesting is, I think we think of the the of Satan as a, you know, pitchfork, horns, and red spandex. That's how I always like to describe it. And like flames, right? And what's it's so much different. It's almost like, you know, what do they say in the usual suspect? The greatest, the greatest um, deceit the devil ever did was to convince man he didn't exist. That that craftiness of saying. Um, you think that I'm just, you know, gonna, you know, burn you up here, or I'm gonna, you know, take you out or kill you. No, 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 no. I'm just gonna make you ineffective. I'm just gonna make you lukewarm. I'm just gonna make you, I'm gonna lie to you and say that, um, you can do it yourself. You can go your own way. You, you have choice. You know that, that you have the knowledge of good and evil now. Go your own way. Kick your own doors down. Make it happen. Hustle. And there's truth to, to the sense that there is. I've been seeing this. You know, This has happened with me since starting this channel. I feel an obligation to stream. Yeah. And I feel obligation to share. But also, selfishly, I know that I'm accumulating something that I can pass to my kids. And I think about it a lot. Like, you know, some people are just like, let's do TA on hex. I think about this and I go, hold on. When I'm gone, my kids are probably going to watch this stuff. Hmm. And I'm, and I'm like, well, I better, you know, at least share this process and share these things. And to me, it's such a, it's like a diary, right? You're like a recording these things. I think that there's something so significant well, it, obviously, it's the most important thing you could possibly do, but that we have this ability to turn it right side up by giving authority back to and choosing to give authority to Jesus and in, in, in the one who created it all. And I almost feel like, just get ready. Yeah. I mean, the adventure... The amazing thing, you know, we talk a lot about in the secular world of self-help about what's my purpose, Steve? You know, how was I created? And people are like, well, think about your personality and then think about your experiences and think about what, you, and I, I talk about those things a lot. Like, hey, what do you do that you just love to do and you lose track of time? I love playing baseball, man, or whatever it is. Hey, this is good. You, the, a lot of times it's around creation of who God created you to be. You enjoy these things. Well, now you think about it and you say, hold on a second. If the creator of all things loves me, want, and, and I, I get aligned right by giving him the authority and rule over my life, it's almost like this incredible adventure begins in the sense that, hey, what are we going to do today? Yeah. Where are we going to go? What do you want me to do? And I've run into people. You're you're one of these guys where it's almost like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And it's almost like you're expecting because you're listening to his voice that he's going to do something. And he's going to also tell you, hey, this is why I brought you here. And that almost nothing is wasted in some respects um, because you see him in all things, but also he's doing supernatural things. Like I mentioned to you before this, like I saw a miracle before this. I'm like, the Lord is so good. And I'm like, let the adventure begin, right? And let let us, but let me ask you this as we put a cap on this. What are the implications of all this? What if, you know, I think about great awakenings and revivals, and I think what happens if millions of people give their authority back to Jesus. And they say, I'm going to follow your voice. I'm going to listen to your voice and I'm going to obey you. And I'm going to push away all these other voices. And I'm going to say, you have no authority over me. What are the implications of that? Because you said there's two sides of the coin. Yeah. Well, the implications are we get to participate with Jesus in accomplishing the father's vision. That's the biggest deal. It's not about things. It's about 
fulfilling the Father's vision for creating. I mean, a lot of times people want to know what Jesus is doing, and they'll push him back in the past or they'll push him forward into the future. But what is he doing right now? Jesus, what are you doing right now? See? Well, what you'll find is that he is about fulfilling the Father's vision. If you want to know what Jesus is doing, he has one thing and one thing alone on his mind. And that's about fulfilling his Father's vision. So you see that in the creative process in his, in his Old Testament name, Jehovah. He, was, he created. He took what was in the, the Father's mind, all the things that they had talked about before they ever got it going, he then began to materialize it. And how did how are we told that is done? He starts speaking it. So yeah. what the Father spoke to him, he started speaking. And guess what started to happen? Light be and light was. See? So when you start listening to Jesus, what is he doing? He's fulfilling the Father's vision. His in sole intention is to fulfill the Father's vision, period. So what are the implications? We get to participate in fulfilling the Father's vision. Yeah, yeah. That his man, both male and female, would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Now let's put that in, let's now put that into what that looks like in real time. Okay, one of the things that um, you talk about often through crypto is freeing the captives. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what is your plan for freeing, freeing the captives? What's the game plan? What's that look like? How is that going to be accomplished? Okay, freedom and sovereignty. Freedom and sovereignty. How are you going to free them? How are they going to exercise their sovereignty? Well, if you're operating in the upside down world of Satan's administration of what God created, there is no such thing for man in that world. There is no such thing as freedom. There is no such thing as sovereignty. There is no such thing as setting the captives free. He'll make you think you're free. He'll make you think you're sovereign. He'll make you think you're, but there's no such thing. There is no provision for it in that world. So what are the implications of going? We actually get to accomplish that. We actually get to set the captives free. How? We're describing it. Start talking to Jesus. He's going to bring you into his vision. When he brings you into his vision, he's going to teach you how his kingdom works. When he teaches you how his, how his kingdom works, he's going to teach you your role about what that is. And then he's going to train you how to perform that. And guess what? You're going to learn how to rule your area of responsibility in the fullness with him in the fullness of his nature and character. OMG. Right. What does that mean? Everything I touch, everything that's within my influence is under the full reign of Jesus. Well, what's the implication of that? Well, when I hook up with Matt, guess what? Now there's two of us. When I hook up with Darren, guess what? Now there's three of us. When I hook up with Sam, now there's four of us. When I hook up with John, now there's five of us. And guess what? This thing starts growing, and everyone who comes into that sphere of influence is now coming under the authority of the one who is there to bless and protect. And everyone who comes under our authority, we exercise our authority to bless and protect. And guess what? Blessing protecting does not include, in, you know, slavery does not include, you know, it doesn't include any of those things. By the way, it doesn't even include equality. Did you know that there is no concept of equality in the kingdom of God in heaven? There's no concept of it. It's a word that has no meaning. Okay. Well, equality is only something that happens in, in 
Satan's realm of control over the administrative apparatus of God's creation. See, why? Because it creates distinction. It, cre it makes, you know, to declare yourself equal means you must first declare yourself unequal. Yeah, yeah. And then to declare yourself from an unequal position or a subordinate pos position, to declare that you're going to become equal means you have to have greater authority and power than the one that you're trying to become equal with. It doesn't work. That's not how it works. That isn't what occurs. If so in the kingdom, that is a concept that does not exist. Well, how nice is it going to be to live in an environment with others, your term community, when people aren't worried about being equal? Yeah. They just are. Yeah. Yeah. They just well, are. Well, and that idea, you know, you think about the child, you know, little kids are great, right? Because you know when a child has no fear. You know, and I, I just think about, you know, I'm thinking about my my wife rocking babies, right? Again. Yeah. yeah. And I think about that environment that you create for kids, that safety and fully loved, and they don't know, you know, they don't know a lot of things that are happening outside of all of it. And there's a picture of this future kingdom of heaven, right? This idea that being fully known and fully accepted and in, in all of your attributes. And, you know, I think about the, the garden, right? So they come, their eyes are open and what do they do? They cover the thing that is different about them. Yeah. Somebody said to me before, they're like, did they cover their elbows or knees or did they cover their foreheads or no, they covered the thing that was different yeah. and they were ashamed of this thing that was, you know, the genitalia, right? They were different and it's interesting that we are now, you know, constantly doing the same thing. We're either saying, I'm going to puff myself up and look better than I am. And that's going to give me authority over you. Or, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, whether it's pride or whether it is, um, you know, obfuscating the reality, right? Cause we don't feel like we can just rest and be, we feel like we have to dance for someone or be someone. And it's like, I feel like in this world when it's upside down, I'm always covering something. I'm always, you know, faking it. And it seems like what God is saying is you don't need to fake it. Yeah. You know, in me, you are, you're a son, you're an heir, you're, you're fully accepted and fully known yeah. and fully valued. So that's where, you know, where peace comes from, right? This idea that, hey, I don't have to, I don't have to perform. And I think that's another thing that so many people deal with. I dealt with this so much, Steve, is that I was, I felt inadequate and I felt like I had to develop some sort of skill or ability to show people that I had value. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are performing for people's approval and they think, well, mom and dad didn't love me or somebody didn't show me this and I, I, I need to prove myself to them. And I feel like we've got all kinds of scorecards for that. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is people get their bank account with crypto to a certain point, And then they're like, why do I still feel empty? Why do I have sudden wealth syndrome? Why am I feeling so? And that's what I think is so interesting about what Paul said. He's like, I have peace in any and every situation in plenty and in want. And you hear stories about this idea of really, can you have peace and have cancer? Can you have peace and be in torture? Can you have peace and be going through the storms of life? If you listen to his voice, he carries you through the stuff. And that's, you know, that's why right before we got on this call, I'm like, I saw he goes before us and he, there is a plan. There's a mystery about it. I have to admit, you know, yeah. he doesn't like, I don't have burning bushes on my desk, yeah. you know, and and I, I long to see that, right? I do really, I, I really like believe that. But I'm also enamored with the idea that if we just touch the hem of his garment, and I love that picture because what it says is the woman who is bleeding, she 
reached out. She chose Jesus and she said, if, and, she, and it was like a, a very small thing. It wasn't like, let me get his attention. Let him speak to me. Let him touch me. Let, you know, he needs to do something for me. No, no, no. If I just touch the hem of his garment, which I think is this picture of, just give me Jesus. Just give me anything of him. And of course, this is power went out of him and he was amazed by her faith. In this this idea of as we long for, I think there's a lot of benefits to this, Steve. It's funny. What I love about God's creation is there's all kinds of like incentive built into this. You get yourself turned right set up and you start seeing things this way and you go, whoa, you, you don't know the power of having peace in the storm. Like there's nothing to describe it. And it doesn't mean that, you know, Things don't happen because if there is, if there are all these people in this world who have given their authority away and are trying to get theirs, I mean, there's all kinds of dangers in this world that is really a result of believing the lie and going our own way. But that's why I'm so, it's funny. And, I, you know, we've talked about this before, but there's a part of me that's like, I'm so amazed by the grace of God, because I almost feel like in the midst of us not understanding this, he still is gracious, Absolutely. right? And yeah. just like patient with us. And it's like, even in the midst of not knowing this stuff, I'm like, I'm 50 years old, dude. And here I'm still learning what the gospel is. Yeah. And it's, so it's not like a transactional thing in the sense that is this constant depth of like, you know, a, a well that you can never reach the bottom of. Like you can, you can, like he's okay with these questions. He's okay with these things. And it's like, what I love about what you said and what I love about this whole interaction with you is in the kingdom of God, there's no middle man. No one, there's no priest that stands in the middle. There's no pastor. There's no person. You have direct access to the source. Yeah. And Jesus is alive and he is speaking. Yeah. Period. And to me, that is revolutionary. And, you know, now I think about it. I think about Paul walking around the Mediterranean four times, getting shipwrecked on Malta. And I go, this is what he was doing. And this is why this thing absolutely exploded. It's because there's real power in it. And that's the thing I always was upset about with kind of Christians when I was a kid as I did not see that power. I did not, it did not have, it was a form of godliness, but denying its power. It was lukewarm at best. Yeah. And to see it this way, it's almost like it's white hot in its calmness. Yes. In its yes. peace. And I absolutely love it. Well, Steve, thank you so much for once again, devoting two hours of your day to, to doing this. I know you love talking about this stuff. I love it. And I, I really, really appreciate you. And it's funny, like I got so much out of this personally. So mm -hmm. thank you. Very Anything fun. you want to share with anybody that's been watching this or just any, any last words of encouragement to people? Um, there are two things that are, that are on my mind. Um, so I appreciate you, you asking that. Um, the woman who touched Jesus's garment, um, it talks about, <clears throat> you know, she was bleeding. Yeah. Well, life is in the blood, we're told. Yeah. yeah. And so what was happening is life was gushing out of her uh, and had been for uh, a number of years. And so she didn't go to the physician just, you know, you probably went to all kinds of physicians, but she went to the one who had life because her life was gushing out of her. Wow. And she could not stop that. Well, that's what I hear through John May's question. Life is gushing out of him and he goes to the, to religion and, you know, and he, it's still not, restoring life. Yeah. Taryn, that's what I hear. She wants to hear. She wants to do this. She doesn't know how. Life is gushing out of her and she can't stop it and she doesn't know where to go. Well, 
just go to him. Just touch, just reach out. And guess what? Power will flow out of him. Wow. Okay? And when power flows out of him, he'll bring you to where he is. And where he is is where your life is waiting for you. Wow. That's where it is. The second thing, probably to a business guy out there, I don't know. Um, I played baseball. It's all I knew how to do. I could run really fast. I could throw the ball through a wall and I could hit it a mile, especially for a small guy. Um, Jesus decided to take me out of that and put me into business. I had absolutely no idea what a debit or a credit was. <laughs> Not only did he put me in, put me into business, he had me start a business. And then at the appropriate time, he took me out of that business and put me into consulting. Now, can you imagine being a consultant, not having a clue what business is about? <laughs> right? He said, son, if you want to learn the game, you got to play the game. So get in the game. And so he took me through all of this. So fast forward years later, was helping this company that was in a lot of trouble. They asked me to take a senior management role to help them out. I put a guy into, um, into, a scene, into, into the chief engineer uh, position. Uh, this was an international company. And he comes to me one day, he says, can I buy you lunch? I said, sure, I'm, I'm cool with that. He says, yeah. So we go out to lunch. We have a good time. And he says, hey, the reason I brought, I, I asked to have lunch with, he says, I've been around a long time. I've never seen anybody talk about business the way that you talk about it. Can you point me to some books where you have learned how business functions in the way that you describe it? I've never seen anything like it. I said, oh, I said, um, are you sure you want to know? He said, absolutely. He broke, he got his pad out and he was going to write down the titles, yep. the titles to the books. I said, virtually everything that you have heard from me and seen from me has come from one source. He said, really? He said, what's the name of the book? I said, his name is Jesus. If you want to learn how business is really designed to function and operate, talk to him. He's the guy who created it. He is the source. And what I love is you didn't say the Bible. No. And that's, I think it's really important, folks, that you recognize. And this is one of the first things that I was a challenge to me when I was talking to Steve is, I, I've come to see this so clearly that the Bible is a derivative. It's a really great tool and it helps reinforce things, but it is not the source. And I think that that's so important because it's a book. And if you think about the printing press and all that stuff, it's words on a page. However, God uses it a lot for me, for you, all those things. But this is why Steve, you at, 71 and me at 50 see things the same exact thing differently when we listen to his voice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So awesome, man. It is just like Jesus, all this counterintuitive stuff, right? You're yeah. expecting him to do this thing. You're like, dude, why didn't you do this? And you're like, it's cause I'm the architect, man. I started, <laughs> I created all this stuff. Like, you know, hang with me and you want to see strategy. You want to see amazing stuff, man. It's cool. It's really cool. And thank you for making it. I feel like what you're doing for me is you're making it so much more rich. It's like in Technicolor, but it's also, um, it's really accessible. Yeah. And it's the way in which you, you share it. And, you know, the, the other thing I just want to give you like props for is, well, one, you're, you're, spitting truth but also your um your just your way your way your patience and your kindness and your way about and your generosity so thank you for this time so many people in the chat are so appreciative of of this time and i'm just glad that we've got this you know recorded and folks can come back to it 
But thank you again for giving your time here on Friday. My pleasure. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve man. Folks, once again, once again, amazing, amazing. You know, I look forward to this, you know, three times, right? We've done this three weeks in a row and it's so different, right? Like, and, and I was, I was concerned, you know, crypto heartbeat, you know, you talk about crypto all the time. And what's really interesting about this is I'm just bringing you into something that I'm experiencing and I want to be transparent and real with you. Um, and what I love about what's happening in the world is I feel like a lot of things that have been upside down are trying to get right side up. And you're seeing something and I think you're in this world and it's like, you know, being called out of Egypt. You've heard that story, right? The Israelites being called out of a place of bondage. Somebody said one time, it's not that that happened. It's not that we think about this this experience of being called out, but that it happens all the time. And Jesus in his voice is calling us out of these places. And there's so many people I love in, in Hexaco. I just love it. Regular people, right? With addictions, with challenges, with frustrations, with money problems, with all kinds of stuff. Um, my grandmother said to me one time, she said, he's always been enough. And I would say that it's true. So amazing folks, amazing stuff. I appreciate you, you walking this journey with me. Um, you know, there's work for us to do and I'm so thankful for Steve. So thanks for being here, folks. Take care of yourself. Don't mess with Texas or the Philippines. Um, and thanks Steve's tags. Take care, everybody. We'll catch you next time.